Welcome to The One Inside, an internal family systems podcast. I'm your host, Tammy Salenberger. On today's podcast, Joan Ryan and I talk about exploring the integration of IFS and the Enneagram. Hi, Joan. Good evening. Hey, Tammy. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Um, I'm okay. You, you may hear barking and you may hear a little scratchiness in my in my throat. Um, so I'll apologize for that in advance. A part of you wants to, your manager part wants to let everybody know that these things might happen, kind of anticipating. Right. right. I'm anticipating problems that may or may not happen. Um, the barking is more likely and is not me. <laughs> I think the barking has happened. Um, the... I think the last one, I think the heart center, we had some, we had Rosie's presence in the we heart did. center. We did. Mine is um, sound asleep because I took her for a walk in the snow. So she should, she might sleep all night long. That would be lovely. <laughs> so, so I can't, as usual, tell you what I see out my window because it's pitch dark out there. <laughs> um, did you get any snow start- today? Mm-hmm. What? Did you get any snow today? No, it no. rained. Yeah, actually, it was 15 degrees yesterday. And by about 10 o'clock last night, when the fire alarm went off, it was 40 <laughs> degrees. So I, I have no idea. But let's see if we can't get uh, get focused here. Okay, so um, today, this is our fourth episode already, I can't believe it. We are talking about the head center types and internal family systems. So our first episode, we did an introduction to integration of IFS and the Enneagram. The second episode, we did centers of intelligence. The third episode was the heart center types and IFS. And today we're talking about the head center types and IFS. If we can focus enough <laughs> to do you it. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, since neither of us are head types, uh, it's a challenge. So, so I actually thought, okay, don't let your critical parts of, or your critical irritated parts of, of certain head center types, <laughs> those yeah. parts had to uh, give us some space. I'll, I'll put them on, under, um, under a microscope. And I mean, I do have a strong line to type six from my type nine. So we'll see if we can't pull that. So the head center types are types five, six, and seven in in my uh, part of the Enneagram world. That would be observer five, um, loyal skeptic, or the older name, which I love, devil's advocate, six, and Epicure or maybe Adventurer Seven. And like the other three, uh, the other two triads, sorry, the heart and the body, the center type here is six. Um, It's the point on the central triangle in the middle of the diagram. So three is the center of heart, nine is the center of body and six is the center of head types. The reason that that's important is because the types on either side in the triad share a lot of common concerns. And for our purposes, what we're beginning to find is that they tend to share some common parts. Yeah. So the head types are all likely to have, just for some examples, whether it's five, six, or seven, they're going to have analytical parts. They're going to have logical parts. They're going to have researcher parts. Um, And they're going to have parts that are related to anxiety and in some cases, fear. Um, Some of those parts are going to be easier to see, and some of them are going to be harder to find. But if we follow the protocol, uh, the IFS protocol, I think we'll find them combined with the structure of the Enneagram material that we have um, that's telling us that they kind of have to be there. Yeah, and I remember one time you and I talking about, I don't know if we're talking about sixes since we talk about sixes a lot, um, the idea around some of the characteristics of five, six, and seven are actually like manager types to manage the fear and anxiety. So like the five, like the researcher 
is part of that is to manage the anxiety. So the so the researcher would be a manager that is, um, and maybe even a firefighter, right? Like whether it becomes before yeah. the exile or after the exile. So whether it becomes before the anxiety or after the anxiety, that uh, research needing to know information um, in order to manage anxiety. So managing it before it happens or firefighting it after the anxieties. Right, and, and what we would expect to find, and it's a, the five is a good example, what we would have expect to find in the five, if we were able to, to have the five client really get into conversation with those managers that you're talking about, is probably an idea in the part that knowledge is a way to either deflect or eliminate anxiety or fear. Yeah, yeah. So that's where, you know, using IFS protocols, that's where we're going to expect those manager parts to be stuck. Yeah. In the idea that if I can just get enough information, it will quell these uncomfortable feelings of anxiety or fear. Yeah, and right. sometimes that's true, but it's more likely to have been true in an earlier time than in an adult space. Love and I think that, right? Be, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's going to be true with with the sixes as well. Um, I want to back up a little bit to the sixes because six can be very difficult to I, to self identify to. Um, because of the habit of mind and the habit of thought, um, which is centered around doubting and questioning. Um, that's why one of the names is loyal skeptic. I'm going to question until I find out if it's right or not. Um, the complication beyond the fact that doubting itself is a complication is that there's two different, clearly different presentations of the fear that drives the type six. And again, in my corner of the Enneagram world, we would call it um, phobic and counterphobic. Phobic being the flight response to fear and counterphobic being the fight response to fear. Um, the third one, the freeze response, we reserve for my part of the Enneagram up at nine. But for sixes, it's usually fight or flight. And in the 25 years or so that I've been doing this, I haven't ever seen a six who didn't have some of both, but one is usually much more familiar to them and prominent, which I think combined with IFS tells us that the managers have a preference for fight or for flight yeah. for various reasons. Um, and I think that that probably is also related to the kinds of exiles that are underneath. Yeah, I was just thinking that too. Yeah. Right. So whatever worked in the childhood, right? Whatever worked in your childhood for comfort and safety and security is what that protector is going to, is yeah. going to keep doing and that strategy. Gonna be, right. It's going to predominate. Yeah. So yeah. Sometimes a counterphobic six looks really, really different. And they can actually look like eights sometimes. Um, and that can be a tough delineation. But if you begin, this is where the com combination of the two systems is so good. If you can begin to talk to those manager parts, you're going to find that in a, in a primarily counterphobic six, the managers are going to have very different stories about their confrontational behavior or their, what we might say is uh, see as aggressive behavior than an eight would have about why they confront or go to an aggressive stance. So eights and sixes, the counterphobic six has a, a, a manager part or a, a part that tends to be more aggressive, but you're saying that part- A group of parts. A probably. group of parts, okay. And so the group, the aggressive group of parts in a six, is that part, group of parts, is that protecting, what, what would be the difference in the six and the eight that that aggressiveness is protecting? So in, in the six, it's most likely that the aggression or the, conf the confronter type parts that we're going to find 
are protecting against a perceived threat and a perceived something that's causing fear, whether it's recognized or unrecognized. So the part is jumping in to protect against that. Now, in any head type, especially in a six, fear will be um, generated if there is a lack of certainty. So one of the things that sixes underneath are trying to seek, and I can explain this in terms of childhood, is they're looking for surety or certainty. The reason being that usually either real or perceived in a six, they were very inconsistent caregivers somewhere in the background. And I say real or perceived because sometimes it's really blatant and sometimes it's not. It's just the way that child um, saw it and took it in. So what that does is it says the world is uncertain and the only way that I can protect myself is to try to get as, to as clear a certainty on any given topic as I can. And that's mm -hmm. what the parts are gonna believe. Mm -hmm. That's the sixth size of this. And so sometimes that response looking for certainty is gonna look aggressive or confrontational. Interesting. I'm gonna stand yeah. up against you and <clears throat> argue yeah. to see what's going on. Yeah. The opposite end, if we go look at the eight, is not responsive to fear at all, because most eights don't relate to the idea of being afraid of things going wrong or the kinds of things that scare sixes. Mm -hmm. The eights are much more concerned with being in control of their own self and their own environment. Mm. And it's not a fear, it's just a need. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if I talk to that same confrontational part or group of parts in an eight, I'm going to expect it to be more about um, protecting against their freedom being infringed upon or their control of themselves being infringed upon. And you've heard me say, I think in, in other classes that eights can look really aggressive and can argue really hard for their own position, but it isn't really that, that they don't want you to disagree with them. They just wanna know whether you actually believe in what you're saying. And they don't really wanna control us unless it's necessary to protect themselves from being controlled. Yeah, I, this it's is such a good, yeah. right. And it's such a good example of uh, what we've talked about before is like the behavior of the part might look the same, but the exile underneath of it or the feeling underneath of it or the reason that protector is doing that, like the 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 reason the reason that protector is um being aggressive is so different. And the thing about the six is like just to bring us back to the to the head types. That's so interesting is that um, it reminds me of the idea that protectors, um, they, uh, what's the saying that we say that like they pull for what they fear, sort of they get, um, they end up getting what they fear is going to happen, like a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm not saying it right. Um, because that's what I'm happens though. Right. Um, my, um, one of my teachers used to say it slightly differently and I'm not remembering exactly, but it's, um, they fight for, they fight against something, which is exactly what they don't want, but yeah. creates what they don't want. Exactly. So I'm having trouble with the language. Too. There's a really good way we say it in, a, in IFS about protectors, uh, what right, they, I'm what they do, but it's too late. It's too late at night for us to remember that. But so that's what I was thinking is right. Like, so if the six is being aggressive out of this fear and out of the, um, out of the fear and the uncertainty, then the person they're being aggressive with is probably not going to give them that certainty, right? Because they're probably no. going to be like, uh, I don't think so. And so they're going to, so the protector is actually going to get what it's afraid. It's going to get disconnection or it's going to get rejection or it's going to get something like that. It's going to get That's the opposite exactly. of what it's looking for. Exactly. It's going to, it's going to engender exactly what it doesn't want yeah. rather than create what it does want. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's, that's what's so interesting here. Um, 
about the difference because I would expect in a primarily counterphobic six, in a fight response six, that those fight parts might not even realize, protector parts or manager parts, they might not even realize that they're acting out of fear. They think yeah. they're acting out of some kind of protectiveness that's necessary. Yeah. Um, and one of the one of the growth growth points um, for sixes is to recognize that they're being run by an underlying fuel of fear, and then to start to be able to do things like reality check it: um, is this really a danger or not? And are we acting out of parts that are stuck in the past? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, very difficult. And I, it always feels to me when we talk about sixes, like it has to be really exhausting <laughs> to be six. I, I can go there under certain circumstances and I know it completely wipes me out even to go there briefly. Yeah, and you, yeah. of course, as a three, have that line to six too. Yeah. Um, but this constant vigilance yeah looking for danger and and protecting against it you know, it's enormously energy expensive well and and again it's like well those parts don't the parts that are so vigilant really need the self of the six to to be okay. there to heal to give that security um and because that's the certainty which i'm probably going to put in like air quotes the certainty that the six needs um and even for me like for the 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 you know the fears around grief and loss like what i need what my parts need is myself and that's what the six needs and if it's constantly seeking that from what's the five seeking that from information and research or for the six seeking that you know, from whatever, you know, if information or other people, whatever that is, and right. not seeking that from their self, from their authentic self, then it's, it is just going to be this constant striving um, and this constant exhaust, exhausting. And that's what well, parts well, do, yeah. not just the six parts, but all of our parts do. And that's why they need to connect to self. Well, and, and you just put your finger on exactly, a, you know, really clear example about why combining IFS with the Enneagram gives us something that we don't have with the Enneagram alone. And, you know, in, in the Enneagram teaching, we have the idea that there are higher qualities to each of these types, but there's no method to get there in my, in my understanding. But if you put an IFS structure and protocol around it, um, you, you, you get the idea that that self is there. And as Dick says, unchanging and unchangeable. It, if you believe IFS theory, it has to be there. Well, that has to be comforting. I know it is to my nine structure to know it doesn't matter how confused I get. That self energy is in there somewhere and can be nurtured. Yeah. So what I want for my six clients or my six friends or my six family members, of which I have a lot, um, I want them to know that that's there mm -hmm. and to know that they can nurture those qualities of self and bring them forward as a comfort to these parts that are getting so upset mm -hmm. yeah. with good reason. But, yeah. but yeah. to know that, um, you know, which leads us into... A different discussion, which is that I think that self energy might be the conduit to the higher qualities that we see from the Enneagram side in type. Yeah. But just, just so that we round this out, we talked a little bit about five um, and a little bit about six. So I'm going to say five is usually looking for information um, to quell the anxiety or they're looking to control how much time and energy they have to expend, again, to quell anxiety. The six is, is looking for analysis and fact and data, and also preparation to quell fear and anxiety. Now the seven, the third one is a little different. Um, very often, especially at the beginning of self-awareness and self-observation work, whether it's IFS or the Enneagram or something else, 
the sevens are not going to connect to being afraid. Yeah. Uh, some of them, um, the ones that lean a little more towards six than towards eight, are going to know that they run anxiety because they're going to feel it and we're going to see it. Some of them are not. Um, so how can this be a fear type and a head type? And the reason is that the protector managers in the seven are going to step away from anything scary or nasty or unpleasant or whatever by going to, um, to their imagination and into their planning capacities and looking into the future. So they jump into the future to get away from any fear or anxiety in the present. And they're really, really good at it. And they can pull, you know, the, the silver lining, to use a cliche, out of the worst situations. Yeah. Um, it is fear-driven, but they don't necessarily know that until we either start to do a lot of Enneagram work, or preferably we start to get them in touch with their managers and their protectors. Yeah, right, and see how their managers are like leading ahead to be like, let's plan this, let's do this fun thing, let's do it. And the energy around that, I think that's the thing is, right, that's the protective energy around striving and striving for fun and future focus and all of that is this seven, and they're so fun. So they're gonna be like, anxiety, what are you talking about? Fear, what are you talking about? But it's that striving energy around having to have fun, having to be planned. And that's that's the energy that doesn't feel like self, that it's like this. And it, well, cause self is not in the future. Self yeah. is only in the present. Yeah. And in some ways, sixes and fives are more in the past than they are in the future because they're, they're relating to past uh, negatives. Yeah negative experiences where the seven is jumping ahead into the future. When you and I share a friend who's a seven who can speak really clearly to, she's had a lot of grief in her life, the person I'm thinking about, and her protective strategy is to go into the future and look for what might be better tomorrow or 20 minutes from now yeah. um, and to plan for it and to really inhabit what it'll feel like because that's how they get out of fear. Yeah, yeah. And you have to, you know, when yeah. the question that, that again, you and I have talked about before that we would want to give anybody who's working with this material is if you are approaching a seven, be really careful and really gentle about that because those parts and those protectors are there for a reason. Yeah. Um, I, I think of a really dear friend of mine, um, who has since passed away, who was the most optimistic, optimistic person I've ever met. She was wonderful when my kids were little um, because she was always fun and she was always redirecting. But if you dug even a little bit into her background, there was such tragedy there um, and, and so much loss. And this was a woman who lost all three of her siblings um, at very young ages. But it, you know, she just had this sunny, forward-looking um, perspective. Um, and I can see in retrospect, you know, how she protected herself with it. I didn't know about IFS then. Yeah. Um, but, but the protectors were in, in her were just incredibly strong and yeah. well developed. Right. Well, we, that's we what we understand is the the stronger our protectors are, the more stronger our exiles are. Sort of the more intense the exile um, energy is. Okay. And so, I think the other thing that I think that's coming up for me is the idea that we want to have so much compassion for our parts. You know, the parts of us that learned, like for the seven, the parts that learned to be future thinking and having fun and planning fun, like those parts learn to do that for a really good reason when we we're little. And for our sixes, the parts that learned, like there's a reason to be anxious. There's a reason to be, to need that certainty. There's a reason to look for the certainty. There's a reason why that those parts do that. And so we want to have compassion for those parts. Those parts aren't wrong. We want to have compassion for the parts and the parts for the five, 
that are looking for, they're researching and they're trying to find information or they're trying to protect their time and energy, there's a really good reason those parts began to do that. And so when we begin, no matter what type we have, or no matter ty what type we are, and the parts we have, really recognizing that, you know, for me as a three, the parts of me that are, you know, doing and striving and driven, those parts learned to do that to protect me a long, long time ago. And I want to have compassion for them. Well, and to end gratitude. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they did their job. One of the things on our outline is to make sure that we sketch out the focus of attention. And I want to be consistent with the other sections, the heart center that we already did and the body center that we'll do next. So let me just go back to that piece and please jump in where you want to. Um, the focus of attention is, is critically important to the Enneagram type structure. And I've said before, and you'll hear me say a million times again, um, if everything else fits, the behavioral patterns and the emotional patterns and everything else fits a type, but the focus of attention does not um, zero in on the one that is, is the center of this type, then we're looking in the wrong place. There's a reason always that that will happen. Um, sometimes, very often, it's a trauma response. But the focus of attention has to be there for us to be really sure that we found the core Enneagram type. Um, and again, you've heard me say before um, that some people find their Enneagram type really e easily and many people have to unlayer lots of material to find it. And both are 100% normal. Um, I have been in trainings with people who've been working on their Enneagram material for many, many years, and all of a sudden something happens, maybe a protector relaxes in IFS terms, and they find out that they've been in a connected point or in a wing or something like that. And so it, uh, it's real important to me to say that, that this doesn't indicate any lack or anything negative. So for the, for the six, the focus of attention is potential hazards, potential harms, things that could go wrong. And what focus of attention means is absent everything else, that's where the attention is gonna, is gonna highlight. And that's the information that's gonna be the biggest on the screen or the whiteboard that I use in my central metaphor. That's the information that's just gonna magnify. Um, and those are the parts that are gonna be the strongest. Right, right. But hold the attention, focus right. the attention on potential hazard if you right. happen to be a six. If you happen to be a five, your attention is going to focus on gathering information and or on managing uh, protecting time and energy because six, fives are the only type that very have parts that very strongly believe that time and energy are finite resources that can be used up. Mm. Now, somebody who has a line to five might have a sense that that's in there, but it's not going to be of the intensity that it is in a five. So those are the two things that we look for. If, it, if it's a five. And if we happen to be a seven, the focus of attention, again, has a few words to it. And I'll go back to my, my much loved um, late uh, mentor and teacher, David Daniels. And he said that sevens are always planning for pleasurable possibilities in the future. <laughs> There's that future David loved alliteration. So it was planning for pleasurable possibilities, um, options and um, and fun. Yeah. Um, using, using the three Ps, as he would say. Um, and it has to be there yeah. or else we've got to do a little more digging. Um, and it's the same thing with Enneagram type, as you just said about parts. 
we have to have a lot of compassion and we have to have a lot of, here's another P, we have to have a lot of patience because people come to seeing their parts and seeing their Enneagram type and seeing their core focus of attention in their own timing. It took me a long time to learn that we have to respect that. Yeah. So you've heard me say in our, our people in our groups have heard me say a million times, doesn't matter if I can see clearly what the type structure is. Yeah, I usually can. I'm an expert. I've been at it forever. It's not helpful to that individual until they are ready to see it and their parts are ready to see it. Yeah. And one of the things that I <laughs> gave me was the explanation for why that's true. Yeah. And that is because the parts have to give their permission for us Right. To, for the individual to see it. And if the parts are not ready, nothing doing. Yeah. Yeah. And we want to, yeah, we want to honor the parts of that, parts of us that do that, you know, honor those parts that say not yet, we're not ready for that. Or this is, this is the information. This is all the information that we need. And Joan, I have to say that I've done that sometimes with clients where I'm like, I can clearly see here's your protector, here's your exile, here's what's happening in your system. And that is not helpful. I mean, sometimes it's a little bit helpful, but not really, not as helpful it is for them to discover it themselves, for them mm -hmm. to be inside and have self connect with a part of them that's protecting the exile and have their own self do it. And that's that self-observation skills that okay. we were talking about last you time have, you have to have that you have to have the openness to understand that none of us have much training in self-observation it's not part of our culture i don't care where in the world you are and i've been lots of places um and so we have to learn that first but we also have to learn to respect that that there's a lot of reasons why things um come clear to us at certain times and don't at others. And yeah, I think the IFS lens is really, is really key to that. Yeah. I love the that. Arts and the protectors and the managers. And in some cases, the firefighters have to be ready to relax enough to let us see these things. Yeah. You've heard me tell the story many times that when I first came to the Enneagram, um, a woman who, still fashions herself quite the teacher, she happens to be a six, um, looked at me and, and looked at my lawyer training and background at that time and said, oh, you're a six, go over there with them. And I'm like sitting in this group listening to these people and it sort of sounded familiar, but I didn't quite get why they were all excited about this Enneagram thing. <laughs> Until a couple of workshops later, um, luckily I was still there, um, and a couple of nines listened to me and said, you know, come over here <laughs> and, and listen to us. And, and I think that gentle encouragement helped my protector parts who are very strong and, and very, I have big eight wings, so very um, strident. Um, but that gentleness was enough for me to say, oh, I can listen to you describe this nine structure and recognize that's where, you know, I really live. Yeah. Um, but before that, no, wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so that respectful piece is, is really, really important. I love it. Um, so Joan, um, next time will be five, uh, our fifth episode, and we will focus on the body types. And yep. our parts around body types. And well, and since that's where I live, you know, uh -huh. my, my <laughs> other mentor and treasured teacher, Helen Palmer, says, you know, when she's speaking of her own type, she's it's the correct view of the world. And so I'll <laughs> say that, you know, to me, the the nine view is the correct view of the world. Now, you know, I'm only I'm only joking mostly. I know. Um, <laughs> but when you do get to you do get to nine. Um, Nine is the type that can see all the pieces of the other eight profiles in ourselves the most easily. Mm. So, you well, know, I'm excited. Kind of we'll, end we'll end there. We'll end there. We know. won't totally end there. We'll end on our the, the triads oh, there. And then we'll have the last episode will be on the higher qualities 
of type as access points to self energy and then we can sort of wrap up anything that we want to wrap up. Right and and um, i'll just remind anybody who's listening. Um, this is an ongoing exploration of how IFS and the Enneagram come together and you and I are in, in major agreement about this that we're collecting examples and we want to hear the outliers we want to hear the people who think well no what they said about my parts as a type whatever and i don't see it that way we want to hear all of that from from out there so yeah. you know please weigh in and let us know yeah because it's an ongoing study yeah and do you want people how do you want people to do that joan do you want people to email you um, I want people to email <laughs> or to post um, to the podcast or um, to send us a note and say, you know, I'm interested, but you've got it wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm happy to do that. They can do it to your website, to mine. It's all connected now. So yeah. Um, you yeah. Know, let us know. Um, we are planning more workshops. Um, we've got two in the pipeline, I think, right now. Um, and we're planning more groups. So if this, what you're hearing in these podcast episodes is interesting to you, reach out to us and we'll put you on the list. Yeah, sounds great. And so Joan, what's your email? Um, uh, the easiest way is to Joan R. Ryan at Gmail. Just make sure there's two R's in there or to Tammy's website or to the one inside. Um, any of those work. Yeah, there's lots of ways to get in touch with us. Yes. So, um, okay, so we will see you guys next time. Thanks for being here and learning about the head types. And, and always um, so much fun to talk to you. It's great to be with you. Thanks for hanging out today. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe. And if you really like this episode, share it with a friend and leave a review. You can follow me on Instagram at IFS Tammy and join our community on Facebook at the One Inside Podcast. Talk to you next time.